All right, we are live. Welcome everybody, Michael Lofito, Monday, June 1st. Hard to believe we're in June already. It feels like May was maybe just as long as April, but uh, welcome to the 22nd episode of Luxury Lunch and Learn. Really excited to have today's guest. Uh, I know I'm gonna learn a ton of things and uh, <clears throat> from, from today's guest, we have from time to time just different perspectives on the industry and what's working, what isn't working, how companies are pivoting. Uh, I've had a lot of different perspectives and today is gonna be a totally different perspective. It's not luxury based at all, but it is something that all agents have to be familiar with. And I was doing a, a, a training a couple weeks back for a bunch of agents in Texas and uh, somebody asked me about uh, what Sam's gonna talk about today. And I didn't have the, uh, I didn't have the clarity that I should have. And so I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna get the expert on as a guest. And uh, again, I believe iron sharpens iron. So um, why not have the subject matter guest on that can help everybody. So with that being said, uh, Sam DeVore, thank you for being here with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Michael. It's, it's good to see you virtually, I suppose. I think we usually see each other a half dozen times a year out of town at different events. I think the first time was the real RGX event in Las Vegas. And I think yes. we both prefer to maybe be spending a week in Las Vegas now if we could, but uh, yeah. we'll do the best we can. So I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, absolutely. So I appreciate you. And for those that are watching, we do have others outside the industry that watch these feeds as well. But for those uh, real estate agents out there that are not familiar with, is it Riso? Sure. So, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, real estate standards organization. Talk to me a little bit about that. The why it was developed and what your role specifically is, and then front and center. We'll talk more about the clear cooperation policy as we get going. Sure. And I think it's probably good to just give a quick background of how I got to where I am with yes, Riso, uh, which is real estate standards organization. Because I have been a sales agent. I've been a real estate agent for many years. Um, Twenty years on the brokerage side. So agent team leader, manager, and broker. Um, my office in Seattle was about 225 agents. Our franchise um, was about 100 agents uh, across two states, actually. We acquired a, another franchise in Southern California. Our mm -hmm. core business was in Seattle. So okay. um, did a lot of work on the brokerage side, obviously. So that's how you know, I've been affiliated with Michael and understanding the sales side of the industry. Um, but I've also worked a lot with the National Association of Realtors on policy side. So the work with the MLS policy group there, um, I was liaison for MLS and data management issues for NAR this last year. So that's where my involvement with the clear cooperation policy is. As liaison, uh, we're not an activist, someone pushing for policy, pushing against policy. We're there to help the group um, bring together what it is that they need, bring that to the NAR president and leadership um, and make sure that they are fully aware of that. Um, and really be able to inform the, the membership of the realtors what's moving through in terms of policy, what that could look like, and help them make decisions as to the policies that they'd like to move forward. So <clears throat> that's my long-winded story about getting the clear cooperation side, uh, my involvement in there. Um, RISO is Real Estate Standards Organization. So um, I joined about a year ago. Um, this is an organization that's been around for many years trying to bring technology efficiency to agents, to brokers and consumers. So you'd know there are thousands and thousands of brokerages. Uh, there used to be over a thousand MLSs and they all created technology in different ways. It all spoke different languages. Um, and you've all seen this as agents. You get a brand new app, you want a new website, you want a, you know, some sort of a system to work with your clients and those systems don't talk to each other. They don't integrate immediately. Either you spend months of time on integration and tons of money or at the end of the day, you're inputting information into six different systems. Maybe your assistants are doing that. Um, so we really exist to create those efficiencies, to make every technology tool speak the same language so that you're more efficient. You're focused on your clients, your clients are focused on real estate. Um, and, and we have most of the MLSs in the country as members of RISO. We have most of the brokerage organizations, over 35,000 brokerage offices are part of our membership. Um, and then obviously the National Association of Realtors serving over a million members. So um, I'm really excited about the work we do. It's behind the scenes. A lot of times you don't hear about what Riso does because it's working that geeky backend code to make sure that each of your apps talk to each other. And that's really how you should want it. You don't want to be involved in that deep backend tech. You just want it to be conforming to Riso standards 
so your tools can talk to each other and you can do your job and, and focus on what you need to. So that's really where, where we are as RISO is bringing the industry together on that common language for data. Okay, that's, that's a really good background. I appreciate that. So, you know, those left brain tech people, they love the stuff that you're doing, the right brain idea, creative people, uh, it's foreign language to us. Okay. <laughs> right, and that's okay. Yeah, um, so, you know, in the real estate industry, depending on which markets, you know, we have, you know, buyer markets, seller markets, but one of the things that you've seen in various markets is, you know, you have a for sale sign and sometimes you'll see a coming soon, right? Uh, a rider above it or below it. And uh, for those that are watching, you know, that that's been a strategy for a lot of agents to, to gear some curiosity, or maybe gear some buyers potentially before a home goes on the market. And some brands, some brokerages, uh, perhaps only offer those coming soons to, in the past, to, to their office first. They get first dibs at it before they roll it out to everybody else. Um, and maybe I'm not doing any justice, Sam, to give some, some context to the coming soon side of it. But specific, specifically, I wanted to kind of ask you, you know, what's NAR's policy on that? What was it in the past? And, and fast forward to, you know, June 1st of 2020, where are things at now with the coming soon strategy that real estate agents have, have used previously? Sure, so I think it's important for people to conceptually divide um, coming soon from clear cooperation because they're related, um, but they're two different things. So coming soon over here is a set of tactics for marketing a property that um, is not defined by NAR. There are certainly best practices that NAR has put out um, for folks using coming soon, but it's de defined a, a number of different ways in different MLSs. Some MLSs don't allow coming soon. Some of them have an official status for coming soon. Some of them have something in between. So um, that's related and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, you know, it's an important thing for folks in certain marketplaces if that's valuable for their clients for them to be able to do that in a standardized way to make sure sellers are getting the best benefit out of that. Um, and then on the other side of that is clear cooperation, which exists in, in markets that have coming soon in the MLS and those that don't. Um, it's really sort of, you know, as we always do this dance at the national level is what does the industry really want to be even? A lot of times your, your brokerages want similar rules. They work across different MLSs, different markets. So do we want a policy here to standardize how we do things in one way? And then do we want to leave flexibility still over here for people to be able to be creative and do things that are in the best interest of their client? So, um, you know, we've seen a wide range of implementations in the industry. And at the NAR level, um, the feedback was we need more standardization here. We need a little bit more of a set of rules so that we can all abide by them, still have our flexibility, still be able to do maybe coming soon if it's good in our market, but for our brokers and our MLS and our consumers to understand what does coming soon mean? Does it mean we're having open houses and having showings and we're selling the property during coming soon? Or does it mean we're advertising it while we're waiting for the interior to get painted and we're gonna start doing showings in two weeks? And these are the questions and the confusion that come up without um, really clear standard ways of doing that. So those are the questions that came to the folks at NAR um, and the emerging tech board said, let's make a proposal to the industry to say, is this how you want it? All these requests we're getting from across the industry where they're saying, my MLS doesn't have all these listings. Some of them are coming soon. Some of them are coming soon on a national portal like Zillow or realtor.com or homes.com, but they're not in the MLS. And I look bad as an agent. When I drive by a property with my client and they say, hey, that's for sale, what do I do? And I say, I don't know. I'm not sure. I guess I need to call that agent and find out. Maybe there's not um, an MLS listing. Maybe there's not an agreement for cooperation yet. So that's really what that group came together to do is provide some more clarity in terms of a policy proposal for the industry. Um, and we can certainly dig in on the details if you'd like to on that. Um, I imagine we will. Um, but that's really where that came from. It's sort of a grassroots ask from the industry of making sure we have a really robust marketplace where Brokers look good. Brokers can give more value to, uh, to their consumers by having this shared listing marketplace. Okay, very good. That, that, that gives some, some context. Um, so again, um, talk to me a little bit about, uh, is there policing going on? Is it left to the brokerage side? So in other words, you know, 
is the experience with a cobalt banker in Washington maybe different with a cobalt banker agent in the Chicagoland market or is it brand like talk to me about who's policing and, and who ultimately you know is giving the agents a little um, trust as to, as to what's best for their their clients sure and and it's it's definitely different depending on how the MLS implements there are certain parts of the rule that are clear they're standard they're part of policy um, but how you do the rules and the enforcement on top of that could be slightly different. So you mentioned Coldwell Banker in Seattle. This is my, my brokerage that I've worked with for many years, but I am you know, full-time as CEO at Riso now. Um, I just figured a global luxury would be hey, appropriate for wait, your I'm show. I'm a big so. Craig Hogan fan. I love what you guys are doing. <laughs> right. with you, it's my backdrop for you. Yeah. Um, so it could be different depending on how the local MLS wants to enforce it. So you'll have some MLSs, and frankly, most MLSs, are taking this initially as an education um, sort of experience. So initially, if someone makes a mistake, um, say they start marketing a property on a public portal and they haven't gotten it in the MLS yet. And the MLS says you can do that and you also need to put it in the MLS within one business day. That's really the core rule um, is that if you're doing public marketing that's intending to entice consumers to contact you about a listing, then it needs to be in the MLS within one business day of you starting that marketing. And it's okay if it's a listing that maybe the seller doesn't want it on the internet. So you've just got a sign in the front yard or, you know, you've got something where you want to wait two weeks to show the property because it needs to be painted, but you want to build up that momentum. If your MLS allows you to do that, which most do, you can put it in the MLS and have a delayed showings feature to that. But once it's out publicly for consumers to see, you want the other brokers to be able to talk about that property as well. This is really kind of the core of the brokerage cooperative, the MLS, is that we can all talk about these properties and help sell them. Um, so it's got to be in the MLS within that one business day. So you'll see um, an MLS might say for the first 30 days, all we're going to do is call people up and explain to them what the rule is, if they, what's called violating the rule. But really, you know, it's somebody who in, in all likelihood has been doing something for many years one way and they need to add an extra step to it. So the MLSs will, what you might call warnings, what just might be phone calls, emails, and say, this is what the rule looks like. You also need to get it into the MLS. I imagine we'll see over time that the vast majority of folks will understand why this exists, that they can still have listings with privacy for their clients. They can still do office exclusives. They can still keep a listing off the internet if they'd like to. Um, but at the same time, you know, there will be folks who may not pay attention to the rule long term. And that's usually where MLS penalties come in. Um, those can be fines and all kinds of different things depending on the MLS. But everybody understands this is a big change. And for the short term, it's, it's more educational um, and helping people out with, with just notices that help them to understand what the new rules will look like. That's, that's great advice. So uh, if an agent isn't sure um, what, you know, I got people watching all over. If an agent isn't sure what their policy is with their MLS or their brokerage or what have you, would it be safe to say, A, check with your, your managing broker and, and, and also call your real estate, local real estate board and, and the MLS, all three, or what would you recommend? Sure, I, I think at the end of the day, the, um, the clearest answer is going to come probably from your MLS, but your broker's probably aware of it as well. So the managing brokers will be very aware of how this is happening there are probably going to be reports coming out from markets. I mean, frankly, we're only one month in from the uh, required implementation date, but there are a lot of markets that adopted this in January and February. So we'll start to see feedback as to, um, you know, folks complying with it, where it becomes an issue. But you certainly want to reach out and see how it's being, um, you know, enforced locally. Um, the big key, though, is that the policy is the same everywhere. The way that it's actually... Um, managed in terms of compliance will happen at your local MLS, but the policy is simply the same. And really, um, the key to understanding it is just a simple philosophy. And that's um, when we have a lot of questions from agents about different marketing tactics. If you are doing something that you're hoping will entice a consumer to call you about that listing, then it's probably something that's going to be viewed as public marketing. Um, if you're doing something just to promote yourself, that happens to you know, be related to something in the business, but it's not enticing somebody to call about a listing that's coming up, et cetera, then it's probably just marketing about you. And there's always nuance, there's always going to be interpretations there. Um, but that's really, you, know, you have to understand your MLS is trying to interpret this rule and the activities of its members, 
the associations are trying to do that. So that's really probably where that line is going to come down is, are you trying to entice people to call you about a listing that's coming up or email you, et cetera? Then you're probably doing public marketing and that's okay, but you also need to get that listing in the MLS, even if it's not ready to show yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. So, you know, I was doing this training for continuing education in Texas. We had agents from all over the state. Texas is, you know, huge, as you know. And um, so multiple, a lot of MLSs, a lot of different boards. And um, so that was something that, you know, I ba basically said, hey, check with your, your broker owner. You know, every, every, every uh, MLS is different because I didn't want to state one thing in Dallas because maybe somebody in Austin or San Antonio would have, um, maybe they police it differently for a lack of a better term. Sure, yeah. So, um, all right, so talk to, uh, you know, I, I, I sent you a couple slides. Um, you know, we have a designation called Luxury Listing Specialist and some of the things that we, uh, we talk about is ways to, to create just that buzz and interest um, as you are preparing a home uh, to go to market. So, you know, I have some extreme examples, Sam, but one was a taxidermist type home where it literally looked like the taxidermist lived there. There were over a hundred stuffed animals, uh, heads and, and various, there's a full lion, a full polar bear. And, and in that scenario, the owner called us in end of June and we weren't ready to go to market till right after Labor Day, the first week of September, we missed the prime season. We were trying, but you know, the philosophy is you got one time to make a first impression. So they, they got rid of all the animals, they painted, they neutralized. And in their case, they, they said, hey, listen, man, if somebody wants to buy it in, in the interim, like come to us, we wanna be down in Franklin, Tennessee with our daughter ASAP. But you know, I'm telling them, wait, we have one time to make a first impression, so yes, you know, I, I, so in our MRED is our MLS, it's the sixth largest uh, MLS. Um, we have an, a listing exemption form where we technically, it's a listing. In other words, we have a signed listing agreement, but it's exempt from putting it on the computer until either a certain date or the professional photos are done. And again, we're broker owned, so our MLS is a little bit maybe different than others. But in, in that case, Sam, you know, what, as an agent, you know, the seller saying, hey, we'd be willing to show it now, but we don't want it on the computers now because we have some work to be done. Um, so it literally took us 60 to 90 days to, to hit that, you know, hit the, the go live button, the, the, the launch button. And, and so talk to me about that scenario. What does that look like? I like giving scenarios because a lot of times stories, right? People learn through stories and real life stories. So I'll, I'll give a couple of these examples and hopefully I'm not hitting you on the spot, but in this example where a home isn't ready because a homeowner's got a laundry list of things to do, but they don't, so they don't want to put it officially on, on the MLS. Now again, in MRED, which is our multiple listing service, we have something called our private listing network, a PLN. It, it, the requirement is you have to have a signed listing agreement. You have to be able to clearly state what the co-op is. You'll work with another brokerage. Sure. And, um, and so that's the scenario for me. I could put it there until we're getting ready, but for some, uh, you know, others that maybe don't have that exact, you know, private network. Um, what do you recommend in that scenario? Yeah, well, that was a big can of worms you just opened up. So I could certainly go into a, a lot of details there. But, um, you know, I think what you, what you explained with MRED is, is kind of the situation across the country is that it's different. You know, you need to look at what the mechanisms are in your multiple listing service. And you may have a PLM like MRED where you can get a listing in but it's not exposed to the public yet. Right. At the same time, the other brokers can see it. Um, you're gonna have similar modules in different MLSs that might allow you to do that, whether it's a coming soon feature that may or may not add days on market. Um, it may be in your MLS you don't have coming soon, but you can input a listing. You can say, I've only got one exterior photo and we're not doing showings for 30 days. Again, depends on what your, your listing um, or what your MLS's rules are. But I, I understand agents are agents are creative. Like I said, I managed over 200 agents in our um, in our primary office. I was an agent. We're always looking for different, you know, interesting ways to sort of have an edge or do something slightly differently. Um, so I think the key is understanding what those rules are, um, you know. And like you said, it, it's scenarios and stories that really bring this out. I've got a uh, a lot of agents friends here in in Seattle, and someone 
um, was doing a photo shoot and advertised that. Um, and it really depends on just exactly how you do that. You could certainly say, we do professional photography for all of our clients. This is the kind of amazing work we do. Um, and then someone else has to make the interpretation. Did you say, this is an amazing photo shoot I've got coming up for my listing in Clyde Hill, or maybe simply everybody knows what you're filming because they can all see the background and where you are. Um, I know that doesn't make it easy for folks, but you know you, you have to understand that's kind of the point of the broker cooperative is we all give up a little bit of flexibility so that we can have those shared listings, so that we have a you know an even fair foundation to work on top of. And there's still lots of additional creative things folks can do. And frankly, you can do all the things that you did previously as an agent. There's just an additional component. And this needs to be in the MLS. It doesn't need to be advertised on IDX websites. It doesn't have to be syndicated. It can simply be in the MLS for the other brokers to see that it's there. Um, and, and that's really kind of the core, again, philosophy is okay. get it in the MLS at a minimum in, in the least... Um, in the simplest way that you know fits your client's needs and then think about how you're advertising that because you can advertise as much or as little as you'd like as long as you have that core listing in the MLS that the other brokers can see. Okay, so you hit the nail on the head. One of the scenarios I sent you ahead of time was the old Bob Barker Price is Right scenario. And you know, remember Bob Barker, don't you? Yeah, of course, absolutely. right? He was in, uh, what was it, Billy Madison, I think, too. But uh, that's, a, that's a classic movie. But so let's just say in this scenario, Sam, uh, you know, I go on a, a photo shoot of a home at 123 Elm Street. And let's just say the photographer with edits back and forth, and maybe we use our good friends at Box Brownie, it takes 48 hours for, for that to be ready and edited. And, and so we hit that live button, right? So it might not be that 24 hours. In that scenario, it would be, maybe it's um, not the right word, but a violation for me to, to be in front of one, two, three, you know, Main Street and say, hey, we're at this amazing photo shoot. It's going, today's Monday, June 1st, as you know. Hey, this property is going to be going live on the multiple listing service on Wednesday, June 3rd. Uh, this home features A, B, C, D. Like that would, that would be a no-no in this new clear co-op policy, correct? It would require you to have the listing in within one business day. And I think that's actually an important thing to specify is one business day versus 24 hours, um, because we will have folks who have something on a Friday um, and they can't get the listing turned in because maybe in one market, the broker turns in the listing and the MLS staff does the input. In another market, the agents might do it directly. So these are requests that we got from brokers all over the country who said, we not only want you know, a standard, give us you know, one business day, Initially, it was, people said three business days, they said 24 hours, the broker said, I don't want on a three day weekend me to have to send staff in to try to get listings in. Um, so one business day was really the compromise. So yeah, I would say that again, the big thing is that um, you can do all of the media you want. You could certainly record something beforehand and show it the day before it goes in the MLS. The intent is really not for marketing to happen before it's in the MLS. The intent is for the listing to go in even if it's in a limited capacity that the public can't see it yet, and then for marketing to start. Um, if that doesn't happen, if the marketing does start beforehand, then the rule is there to say, okay, within one business day, this needs to also be in the MLS. So yes, your situation, you'd have to adjust that timing, either record it and show the video a yeah. day or two later, um, or come back and do a live stream the day before yeah. or the day it goes online. So it's an adjustment. Or, or get the paperwork signed ahead of time. If in the Chicago land market in the Emirates case, you get it in the private network and then you could do the video in that scenario, but it's gotta be in the private network. Right, right, yeah. And I think that's really the key is not, not to, um, you know, there's certainly adjustments that need to be made, but adjustments should be made to focus on what's gonna be easiest for the clients and for the broker as well. And, and that means getting the paperwork done early, getting the listing in the MLS early and not having to dance around, oh my gosh, it's last second, and now I need to post a video, but I can't because I didn't turn in the paperwork. Um, almost every MLS, um, everyone I know of, is going to have a mechanism for you to get that listing in, even if you're not ready to show it yet. Okay, okay. And you talk about, you know, the name of it is Clear Cooperation Policy. So cooperation is working with others, but talk to me a little bit about what went into languaging or at philosophy where, you know, 
agents that represent the sellers, of course, have a fiduciary responsibility to, to what's best for their clients, their sellers. And right. so if in certain markets, if it's a seller's market and homes are at a rarity to come, you know, when they come on, boom, there's multiple offers. You know, yeah. did, did you, when I say you, did uh, Riso take into account all the various scenarios, slow market, hot market, you know, and, and creating a consistent um, uh, rule, I guess? Yeah, so Riso wasn't directly involved as an organization in this. I was there as a representative on NAR's policy board. So just, you know, for clarification purposes there, this is an NAR policy. Um, and Riso will be involved in these conversations when there are data standards involved. So um, I also just happened to be the liaison for NAR's MLS and data management issues this year. So I was there to facilitate with that group. Um, so to your question about what, what the influences were that brought into that, absolutely um, the different markets. So we've got a bunch of big brokers, small brokers, small MLSs, and large MLSs on that advisory board that puts together policy um, to, to bring out to the NAR community and say, is this what you want for policy moving forward? So um, yes, we, we looked specifically at things people had done traditionally, um, particularly cases where you may have a celebrity, you may have someone who doesn't want um, to be, you know, known they have a property on the market. We find this in cases of, you know, someone with a restraining order against someone else. There's lots of different reasons. Um, and you've got to be able to put those clients' needs first because that's what the duties are. Now, as an agent, you know that your ability to work with a consumer has always been limited in some ways, though. It's never been simply the seller told me to do this, so I did it. Um, we've always had Realtor Association, Code of Ethics, state licensing laws, MLS rules, um, federal fair housing guidelines, all kinds of reasons where we have to say, no, I can't do that because of my membership in a group or because of guidelines and, and regulations as well. So um, there's, it's, there's certainly uh, a lot of work to mesh all of those different needs together. But at the end of the day, the group felt that by preserving office exclusives, which would allow a broker or an agent to list a property for a consumer to not expose it to anyone if they don't want to, but expose it within their office if they'd like to, and still not have that out to a large you know, group of people. That really provides all of the privacy needs that a client may need. Uh, once it goes past that point, now we're clearly into a listing that um, needs exposure. And this, is, this is what we're saying. If the broker actually wants to go outside the brokerage, and can't provide enough exposure within it, now we've got a property where the sellers are asking for exposure. Mm -hmm. And in that case, to the group, it seemed fairly clear that that seller's best interests are clearly exposure mm -hmm. and the organized brokerage market is the way to, to ensure that that happens. And, and really, they're looking at these concerns from folks saying, my market's getting fragmented. Not only can I drive by a property and look like a bad professional because I can't figure out where this listing is and why it's there. But in some markets, they were seeing 20, 30, 40% of listings um, selling privately off the MLS. And that's always okay for a seller. It's always okay for an individual to make that decision. But it became difficult for a lot of professionals to understand how 30, 40% of the market um, wasn't benefiting from the basics of economics, the basics of supply and demand. It just didn't seem logical that this was actually a professional marketplace benefiting sellers to the greatest extent, which a large part of how we do that is by broad exposure. So um, mm -hmm. we're looking for a way to make sure sellers who really need privacy still have those mechanisms, and they do. And sellers who clearly desire exposure are getting that through their professionals um, and creating policy to ensure that. No, oh, that's great. Great insight. Um, if you have any questions for Sam or myself, please ask them. I'll check my phone in a minute. Um, and uh, I know I had a question for you because I'm a big, you know, big fan of what those folks over at Inman do. And every morning I go in and see the news uh, that they provide. And I believe something just came across the other day, some kind of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you would know this better than I do, but some some kind of lawsuit or something that just came up recently. I was, I'm was i like, man, this is perfect. I'm going to ask Sam about it. And uh, I'm looking forward as we speak. Do, do you recall what I'm referring to? Um, court, I, denies, I court, court denies restraining order against NAR for pocket listing policy. Top agent network asked for the order two weeks ago in an attempt to stop the National Association of Realtors from enforcing 
clear cooperation policy. So this is exactly kind of what we're talking about, isn't it? I absolutely relate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so and if I'm you not can't sure. speak on that, I get it. I, I'm not. Well, I, I, you know, I, I can't. I can't. I'm not um, an attorney, and I won't speak directly to yeah. you know any sort of litigation. I can tell you that um, the group that talked about this policy talked about all of these potential outcomes, all of these what a lot of people would call unintended consequences, et cetera. They were very aware of people um, in the industry who use many different tools, and they really wanted to make sure that. Um, everyone could still continue to use the marketing avenues that they wanted to, that their clients appreciated, um, but this was an and policy. That was the intent of this group who put the policy together. It's not a you can't do A, B, and C. It's you can do A and you also should do B um, if you're going to do this. So really the intent is not to take away anybody's capabilities for marketing platforms, et cetera. It's just that when you do certain kinds of marketing activities, those also trigger an additional responsibility at the MLS level to put the listing in the MLS. So without talking about any individual organization or group, it's really a concept that doesn't um, stop anyone from using any of the tools they currently have. It just also ensures that they have the listing in the MLS as well. All right, I mean, listen, just on this live training here, I'm learning as we're going, Sam, you're doing a great job explaining it. And, you know, I, I do those coming soon strategies and you've given me the pathway to do it. If you can't make that one business day, um, then, you know, put it in the private listing network in my case. So there's a way about it. So uh, pre appreciate you explain it uh, very eloquently and, and simple. So thank you. I know it's not a simple concept. I know there's a lot of tugging back and forth, but uh, I appreciate it. Let me, let me see if anybody's got any questions. Um, and by the way, while I'm yep. doing this, Sam, if anybody has um, uh, questions, additional information, they want to do some, um, do, do you guys have some free resources at our website? Where, where should people go to find out more? Yeah, you should go to the National Association of Realtors for Feedback. Um, if you just simply Google clear cooperation resources or clear cooperation policy, you'll find a lot of information at the National Association of Realtors. Um, they have policy staff. Um, you know, I just happen to be a volunteer who was heavily involved in the process that year, but a lot of those questions should really go to their policy staff at NAR. Um, they've got FAQs, they've got guides to implementation. Obviously, yeah. you can ask your, your folks at your local MLS, and I think that um, that's the important thing. You look at the largest MLS in the country, California Regional MLS, didn't have a coming soon policy prior to this, um, or a status. Uh, but they've added one now because they're looking for that flexibility, ways to make sure agents and consumers can do these things flexibly and still get that listing into the MLS for the benefit um, of the brokers for one, but clearly for the consumers. Um, there is, I don't know if there's ever been a consumer who said, I'd rather search on 15 websites to find the same listings that I could find on one. Now, again, we, we've got situations where there's celebrities, et cetera, and we'll Sure. keep those abilities out there. But in general, um, all of the MLSs and the associations are trying to find ways to do this to ensure that brokers benefit, consumers benefit, and there's still that flexibility with sellers. Good, 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 good information. Uh, and when you're talking about uh, NAR, you're talking about in the United States, right? Does Can Canadian Association of Realtors, they have their own policy. And so we're, we're talking you know, for agents that are licensed, you know, and with their brokerage in, in the U.S., correct? Right, correct, yes. Okay, all right, just wanted to clarify that for our viewers. Awesome. Well, um, I don't see any questions. This is very thorough. Maybe it's just you were so thorough, Sam. They don't, it's like you hit the nail on the head. People don't like policy as much as I do, possibly. That wouldn't surprise me at all. It's important. It may be informative, but it's not the most exciting thing you've probably ever had on your show. No, it's, 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 it's great. You know, like I said, I had this training, somebody said, Hey, you know, you should know more about it. I said, listen, I'll have, I, I, I agree. Like I'm, I want to, I want to be very knowledgeable about everything. So, um, you know, generals get paid, specialists get wealthy. You want to be a specialist. I have the specialist with this policy on today, Sam. I greatly appreciate what you're doing for the industry and the consumers, right? I mean, it's the same thing that we've done with our, our course. We want to raise the bar for agents, which of course makes the experience for the consumer better. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's kind of, that's critical. Thank you. It's, um, it's critical that people think about that. When we talk about the reputation of real estate professionals, real estate agents and brokers, 
that anything that we do publicly, um, especially industry-wide, is clear that we are pro-competitive, we're pro-consumer, we're trying to enhance fair housing, home ownership opportunities, all of these things that come into play from the big picture. Um, and this is just one of those steps that allow us to do that sort of en masse um, and can really be a great publicity um, and image builder for us because we want to have that reputation as being in it for the consumer and in it for those home ownership opportunities. And, and this enhances that capability. So I appreciate you having me on and, yes, and let me talk about the most exciting things in the industry for a little while. Yeah, absolutely. Well, appreciate all you're doing. Love your flag in the backdrop. Stay safe. Keep raising the bar, everybody. And uh, again, more love. There's just a lot of negative out there. Just make people's day. And, and love doesn't see color, doesn't see Republican, Democrat. Love is love. Appreciate what you're doing, Sam. And have a great Monday, everybody. Keep doing great work, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Bye-bye.